जय हिंद दोस्तों मेरा नाम है नीरज और आप देख रहे हैं एक और शानदार एपिसोड मार्केट की बात ग्रो के साथ का और आज जो हमारे गेस्ट होने वाले हैं वो है ईव कैसल और ये है मार्केट की बात के शो पे पहले फॉरेन गेस्ट है क्योंकि ये गेस्ट इंडिया से नहीं है इसलिए एपिसोड जो है वो होने वाला है इंग्लिश में लेकिन मैं इसकी समरी जो है आपको हिंदी में आके दूंगा टेंशन क्यों ले रहे हो आप लोग तो एक बात इसको लाइक जरूर कर दीजिए क्योंकि यार हमारे फॉरेन गेस्ट का पहला एपिसोड है हमारे साथ और दूसरी बात इसकी समरी जरूर देखिएगा एंड में जाके क्योंकि आपको वहाँ पे बहुत कुछ सीखने को मिलेगा स्पेशली हम लोग इस एपिसोड के अंदर बात करने वाले हैं माइक्रो कैप इन्वेस्टिंग के बारे में माइक्रो कैप कंपनीज क्या होती हैं बेसिकली वो कंपनीज की मार्केट कैप बहुत ज़्यादा छोटी है और उसमें इन्वेस्ट करके कैसे जो है बहुत ज़्यादा वेल्थ क्रिएट कर सकते हैं उस पर चर्चा करेंगे हम इस एपिसोड के अंदर इन एक अमेरिकन इन्वेस्टर और ऑथर हैं जिन्होंने अपनी टीन में इन्वेस्टिंग शुरू कर दी थी इन एक एक्सपर्टीज रखते हैं माइक्रो कैप इन्वेस्टिंग में यानी कि ऐसी कंपनी जिनका मार्केट कैप बहुत ही कम हो उसके अंदर जो है वो एक्सपर्टीज रखते हैं इन कैसल माइक्रो कैप क्लब डॉट कॉम के फाउंडर हैं और इंटेलिजेंट फैनेटिक्स डॉट कॉम के भी को फाउंडर है इसके अलावा वो इंटेलिजेंट फैनेटिक्स कैपिटल मैनेजमेंट के चीफ इन्वेस्टमेंट ऑफिसर भी हैं इन का एक मानना है कि मार्केट में एक्स्ट्रा ऑर्डिनरी रिटर्न कमाने के लिए ये जरूरी है कि आप ग्रेट कंपनीज को बहुत अर्ली स्टेजेस में आइडेंटिफाई कर लें क्योंकि सभी अच्छी कंपनीज शुरुआत तो छोटे से ही करती हैं ऑल ग्रेट कंपनीज स्टार्टेड एज आ स्मॉल कंपनी ओनली माइक्रो कैप क्लब ऐसे इन्वेस्टर्स के लिए एक एक्सक्लूसिव फॉरम है जो यूएस कैनेडा यूरोप ऑस्ट्रेलिया के माइक्रो कैप कंपनीज में निवेश करने में इंटरेस्ट रखते हैं इसके अलावा इन ने अपनी बुक इंटेलिजेंट फैनेटिक्स में उन्होंने कई ऐसी कंपनीज का इन डेप्थ एनालिसिस किया है जो बहुत ही सक्सेसफुल हुई हैं और ये समझाया है कि इन कंपनीज को बाकियों से कौन से फैक्टर्स जो है वो डिफ्रेंशिएट करते हैं तो आज का एपिसोड काफी खास होने वाला है उम्मीद करता हूं कि आप लोग एंजॉय करेंगे आप लोग एंजॉय करेंगे समरी या तो आप पूरा एपिसोड भी डेफिनेटली देख सकते हैं और उसको अच्छे से एंजॉय कर सकते हैं तो चलिए बिना सबे गवाए शुरू करते हैं आज की मार्केट की बात इन कैसल के साथ Hi and welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. So, uh the first question, the first question is what is a micro cap company? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question and many people have never heard of micro cap companies and uh interestingly enough, if there's probably around 70,000 public equities in the that trade globally. and about half of those companies are actually micro cap companies you know and and it depends on the geography whether you're in india or whether you're in the united states um but they usually represent the smallest maybe 15% of public companies that exist in that market so here in the united states they would be considered uh companies that have a market capitalization you know sub 300 million some would say sub 500 million usd in india i'm sure that would be equivalent to you know sub 50 million USD and it depends where where you're at but these are traditionally very small uh public companies and uh I like to tell people you know even the at least here in the United States even the small town that you're from they would they might not even be the largest company in that small town these are small businesses you know and, and uh they they are from any different any type of industry that you would see in small or mid or large cap they just happen to be smaller businesses great so uh The next question will be, what is microcap investing? So, microcap investing is, you know, predominantly you know investors that invest in this segment of the market, and for the most part, it is uh, mainly retail investors, and you know it can range from call it intelligent retail down to you know maybe unintelligent retail. But since these companies are so small and so illiquid. uh um, most of the market participants are retail investors because quite honestly institutional investors have too much capital to bother looking at some of these companies that that are very illiquid and that are very small and so historically you know going back 50 60 you know 100 years of the stock market you know micro cap's been around you know that long you know it's predominantly an investing strategy that is mainly retail investor focused um which is also the structural advantage that micro cap investing has for those smart retail investors that uh, can find these great companies early right so as you were saying that smart retail investor so how a retail investor can start finding good micro caps they uh, the micro caps they will generate uh, you know enormous returns for them <laughs> you know that that is a excellent question um you know there's many ways that you can find companies and it really depends on what type of investor you are 
you know, if you're a deep value investor, if you're a value investor, if you're a growth investor, if you focus on a specific industry, or if you're a momentum investor that might have a shorter term time horizon, if you're a longer term investor that looks to coffee can this underneath your mattress, you know, it really depends on what type of investor you are, uh, will determine kind of how you find these companies. Um, you know, I think historically the way you find microcap companies is, you know, I think there's four main ways, you know, it's just through brute force looking A through Z, you know, through this big swath of companies trying to find the diamonds in the rough. Um, you can find them by, you know, maybe subscribing to a newsletter or subscribing to a forum or being part of a public message board, seeing whether smart people are finding and why. Um, you can find them, you know, through, so through networking, and then you can also find them obviously through screening, you know, whether that's quantitative screens or maybe more qualitative type screens. Um, so it really depends on what type of investor you are and what you're looking for. Don't you feel for a retail investor, there is a lot of risk involved as far as micro cap investing is concerned? You know, I, I think there is. I, there is definitely risk. And I think part of the risk is that at least here in the United States, most people get introduced to microcap investing from, you know, some email they receive or some piece of mail they receive in, the, in you know, at their home um, that says that the company XYZ is at X Amazon or Meta or whatever you want to call it. And, you know, it's usually a paid a campaign that this company pays to do and they're it's really just promoting some sort of story stock that has no fundamentals and in 99 percent of those instances those companies go down 99 percent um and so unfortunately a lot of times that's the first entree that investors get to microcap investing is predominantly the worst part of microcap which is you know those companies that 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 pay and that really don't have any business um, and so I think that you can reduce a lot of the risk investing in microcap is if you stick to profitable businesses uh, here in the United States approximately 18 percent of all microcaps are profitable and I think if investors would stick to the, the companies that actually have real businesses that are profitable, that are growing, I think that reduces the risks you know, tremendously. Right. And in case of some micro caps, we see that some people have an undue advantage because they are, you know, they are having contacts with management or they are in direct touch with the management. Don't you think it's an undue advantage for some people? You know, I... Again, I think it depends on what type of invest you, investor you are. You know, I, I know some really, really good deep value, value type investors in micro cap. And because they're looking for things that are trading below book value or trading for two or three times earnings, maybe they might not emphasize that management is that important because they're buying it so cheap, it doesn't matter. Um, but I think for an investor like me, at least with how I invest, trying to find, you know, unique businesses run by high integrity um, you know, good management teams than looking to hold for the long term. At least that's my intention when I purchase. You know, it 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 is important. You know, for me to talk to management and make sure that I'm investing in, with the right people because you know, oftentimes the smaller the company, the more important management becomes because you know they're they they have a lot of oversight over the business. The CEO usually is not only the CEO, but you know, he's taking the garbage out at night. You know, and so he has a lot of control over that business and he would make sure you're investing with the right the right people that you trust that uh, are have your best interests as hard as a shareholder. Right. What kind of success ratio should a retail investor expect in micro cap investing? What I want to say, for example, I have invested in 10 micro caps. So what is the success ratio out of 10? How many micro caps can give me a good return? Is there a fixed number or what are the chances? You know, I think when you start out investing it's going to be low. And I don't know if low is two out of 10 or three out of 10 or one out of 10, you know, but, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, the biggest lessons in all of investing, not just micro cap is kind of educated to us by loss. You know, you figure out, you know, what to do right, you know, and that's, that's really how the market educates us is through loss. And so, you know, I, I would say, you know, don't be um, dismissive to micro cap if the first one you invest in, you lose money in. You know, look at that as your tuition, your education, and you're going to learn something from that experience that you can apply to the next experience. I, you know, I've been doing this for 20 years, 
And, you know, I would say my hit rate is maybe 60%, maybe six out of 10. And, you know, it doesn't mean that you're losing money on the other four. It just means that you're probably just wrong in assessing the trajectory of the business that you're investing in. You know, you might have made less money than you thought you would have, or you may, or you may have lost money. Um, but this is certainly not a game where you're trying to bat 10 out of 10. Because oftentimes, if you're trying to bat 10 out of 10, you're going to get mediocre returns because those businesses that you're buying are kind of obvious already. You know, they're obviously, you know, good businesses. Um, you know, you're, you're trying to find these companies. And the great, greatest thing part about microcap investing is, you know, discovery. You do have a, a, the advantage of discovery in microcap, you know, finding a very interesting business, a high quality business before one or two other people can mean you know, you're buying it a lot cheaper, you know, because one or two people can move the market, you know, if, if they have sufficient capital. Uh, so discovery is really important in microcap. Right. So uh, my simple point is for a retail investor who is into a full time profession or he's having some other occupation, can he do this kind of research so that he can spot good microcaps? I think you can. And I, and, and I think, um, you know, quite honestly, I mean, some of the better microcap investors I know you know, still have other jobs, you know, and they, they do it on the side or they do it in the evenings and they might have a job that actually gives them an advantage in an industry uh, or, or an area of the market. And that's kind of where they get their, their feet wet is, okay, I'm a software programmer. You know, I know something about this industry. I know something about like the medical technology space, you know, let me analyze those companies because I feel like I can have an edge and, and network my way through that area to find out what the truth is about this business or opportunity. Um, that's how some of the best investors I know kind of get into the space is it kind of tags along with their core experiences or learnings of where they're already educated. Right. So they can just have the knowledge of their work in the investing area and they can just find the companies which match with their experience. Exactly. And then, and then, then you can branch out from there. But oftentimes that's a, a logical place to start. Right. So you said that you have a top down and bottom up framework for selecting micro caps. So can you can just just please expand this for our audience? What is top down and bottom up approach? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would say the top down would be more of a, a macro view. And so kind of the, the very general theme here is I kind of combine tailwinds, this idea of investing in a tailwind and this idea of scarcity. So the top down would be the tailwind. Like I want to find an area of the market where there's you know wind at the back of the industry or this area that they're in um josh wolf who is um, a very kind of famous venture capitalist from lux capital he likes to use the term like undeniable um arrow of progress investing in these areas that have kind of this forceful wind where it's hard to deny that it's not gonna that it's gonna stop going in the direction where it's going um, and I kind of picture like a sailboat, you know, you want to invest where the wind's at your back, where it's pushing that boat. I don't want to go into a headwind where you're, you know, trying to make a contrarian call in an industry. Um, so I try to find these areas where there's a tailwind and that's sort of the top of the top down, um, part of my strategy. And then also the bottom up would be this idea of scarcity. Um, I'm a big fan of scarcity in, in all its forms, mainly because scarcity is likely the biggest driver of price. You know, it's really when you have just a, a lot of demand and not enough supply, you know, and I'm looking for these unique businesses where there's not another one or two or three even like it that are even publicly traded. They just happen to be small and knowing that when there's a tailwind and it's, and that tailwind is forced on one thing, you know, that's where you get a lot of momentum into, into the business and also the stock. You know, I, I'm not interested in buying things that are undervalued that are going to stay undervalued. I'm going to find things that are undervalued that will get overvalued and overvalued businesses you know the scarce businesses are the unique are the greatest businesses because there's just a scarcity of great businesses that exist in the marketplace today i'm just trying to find them when they're when they're small and um probably you know not really probably misunderstood as well um and so i'm a big fan of scarcity it's all its forms and that even goes down to the micro cap level of illiquidity you know the scarcity of shares in the marketplace you know something that trades right. five thousand ten thousand shares mm -hmm. you know it's the scarcity of shares so we combined like illiquidity with a scarce business with a tailwind you know you can get situations that go from undervalued to overvalued and that's predominantly what i'm looking for 
can you can you give give us one example uh, of a business in which you have invested and you know there was scarcity of that business and you uh, kind of took advantage of it you know i don't like to talk about present companies i've invested in just because i don't want people to rush out and buy anything that i'm in currently but you know what one one example of this uh, from the past was um, there's a company over here in the US it was called Kpasa and this was the first publicly traded social network this was before facebook went public way back you know 10 years ago mm-hmm. and you know it was kind of this top down of you know the whole world was going into you know uh, you know joining a social network uh, there was none that were public there was a lot of buzz about facebook going public but there was really only one public public way for an investor or institution to participate in this trend and it was just this one company that was quite honestly a bad social network but it was the only thing that was public that was a social network um and so i ended up uh buying a significant stake in this company and it was it was around it's called a dollar a share and over the next 12 months as more and more investors more institutional investors wanting to to, to buy into this trend, um, they also bought it. You know, and it went from like a dollar to twenty dollars just in the back of just this idea of a tailwind and then scarcity. There was only one really security for people to buy to participate in that trend or tailwind. Um, and that and obviously that it's not the perfect example, but it's kind of the purest example of the combination of kind of tailwind and scarcity. There's a, several businesses I'm invested in today that um, are kind of have that same dynamic where uh, it might be on the medical technology side, or it it may be on the software side, where they really have a one of one product, and um, it doesn't matter if we're going through a bull market, a bear market, or a recession. That business is going to continue to grow because of that tailwind. Right, great. Uh, you said that you like managements which have intelligent, fanatic attributes. What are the what are some of these attributes? How can retail investors identify companies with such management? It's a good question. I co-authored two books on the topic of intelligent fanaticism. And for those, for the listeners that aren't aware, you know, Charlie Munger is the, the first person that used the term intelligent fanatic, and he used it in a couple of his speeches to kind of define an entrepreneur that started a business from scratch and then grew it into a business of substantial size that ultimately ended up dominating a niche, dominated their geography or even their industry and not just dominating it for a year or two, but for decades. And he mentions a few of these companies. Some of them are public. Some of them are private uh, companies here in the U S predominantly. Um, but he mentions them. And so me and my co-author wrote two books kind of highlighting the companies that Charlie Munger mentioned in those speeches uh, as having leaders that were intelligent fanatics. And then the second book was us trying to kind of finding that blueprint and finding some other ones that we thought also fit that. And then pulling out some lessons and learnings from how these leaders build a business from scratch to one that dominated an industry for decades. I mean, that's uh, there's not very many companies out there that are like that. Um, and quite honestly, most of them are private, just to be honest with you. Um, but so that's kind of where the term intelligent fanatics came from. And getting back to in microcap, you know, the, the smaller these businesses are, the more important management becomes. And so I really wanted to apply these intelligent fanatic type lessons to my investing in microcaps. You know, I want to find these to find great companies small. I want to find great leaders. Mm-hmm. Um, and so trying to identify kind of intelligent fanatic attributes, it's sort of Captain Obvious to some regards. You know, this isn't anything like no one's ever heard of before. But, you know, really kind of trying to apply them, I think, is is difficult and it's kind of an art. It's, not, it's less of a science and more of an art. Um, but I would say kind of first and foremost, you know, does the leader have a history of winning? You know, have they built a company or two prior? You know, do do they seem quite honestly, just really, really smart? Um, you know, can they, have they built something in the past? Do they, are they, have they built great teams in the past? Um, one of the key things that we found in our research is mainly that these people were great team builders. You know, they didn't have, they weren't looking for yes men or women, you know, they were looking for the best people to put alongside them because that's how you ultimately scale a business. Um, so kind of on the public market side, you know, going back, what I would do is go back two years or 10 years, however long that company has been around and just read everything you can on the entrepreneur on their history before starting this business. Um, 
also you want to see obviously skin in the game. You want to see alignment of interests. Um, you love to see a low salary. You love to see self-sacrifice for the business, you know, taking out personal loans to backstop, you know, the business or their vision. That's what you love to see. I mentioned putting great people around them. I think that's also important. And it kind of gives back to my part of the way I invest is I do a lot of qualitative research and I try to not only talk to the CEO, but talk to the people around the company, around the CEO. Um, so it kind of gets to that point. And also, I think probably another point that's worth mentioning is do they have a culture of excellence hmm. at that company? And right. do they have a culture at all? You know, and so like that begs the question, how do you assess a company's culture? Well, you don't actually assess a company's culture by talking to the management team. You, t you assess the culture by talking to the lowest employee at that company. Do they like working there? Would they move across the street for a, at a competing firm if they got paid, you know, 5% more? Um, do they love working there? And that's how you really assess, you know, the culture of a business. And it's hard to apply this to microcaps because what this means is you have to do a lot of on the ground diligence. You have to do a lot of just talking to people. Um, and that's, that really just kind of gears back to how I invest, you know, companies and businesses aren't Excel spreadsheets. They're a group of people, you know, moving in the direction, pushing a business forward, you know, and that the vision and the strategy is up to the founder and the management team, but the execution, you know, is really the people on the ground. And so you want to talk to all those people in between. Right. So winners, team builders, skin in the game and culture of the organization plays an important role in finding good micro caps, basically analyzing the management of a good micro cap. Okay. Uh, and it's really, I'm, I mean, it's, it's really, I, in, in micro cap, you find a lot of hustles. And what I mean by hustles is you find a lot of one or two person management teams that are doing 90% of the work and they could build a business from, you know, 1 million USD to 5 million or 10 million but then they reach their cap. Um, and I'm not interested in finding them, you know, and you can actually still do fairly well, I think, investing in microcap if you just invest in some hustles that, that are good hustles. Um, but I'm not interested in that. I want to find small businesses that can scale. Um, and I'm looking to find a company that has the people that can scale, the culture that can scale, the processes that can scale, and the systems and controls in place. And really... So they can just scale a business from zero to 100 million, 200 million, 1 billion. So I'm trying to find those special cases. That's why it's important to find these great leaders that have great people, great processes, great track record and just scaling a business. So do you not invest in large cap at all? Or is it like is a, there is a proportion you invest in large cap and some proportion in uh, micro caps? I'm 100 percent focused on micro caps and I would not recommend that to other people. You know, right. so right. Right. <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah, that this is, you should not be 100% focused on micro caps. I just, I just happened to get to focus on micro caps when I was a teenager, and it grew into a hobby, that grew into a profession, that grew into other things. You know, and so it's just all I've ever done, um, and so I feel comfortable being 100% focused in this area. But I wouldn't recommend it to other people. Right. Monish Pobrai, uh, even Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, every one of them is saying that best investors think of themselves as the owners of the business. They buy and they don't sell. So what is your thought on this statement? They buy and they don't sell. It's a it's a good question. I I think you when you invest in micro cap or small cap stocks, I like to think of it not as owning, but rent to own. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, most companies, you know, most companies you like, quite honestly, even the ones I have in my portfolio and my portfolio has some turnover with it, you know, they, they only deserve to be rented. You know, ownership is earned. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unlike large caps, you don't have a lot of past history to work from. You know, this is how this is how I think about it. If you wanted to move to a new area or city, you, you might first rent an apartment or house before you bought one in that area. Um, mm. you know, and so at the service, you might like all the attributes of this city, you know, might have the right education for your kids. It might have the right public transit. It might have the right restaurants, the artistic community, whatever you're looking for, you know, but you still might go and rent an apartment in that city to see what it's actually like. And, and finally, it's kind and of, finally it's you kind can of decide. with micro cap. Yeah. And finally it's you can decide whether you're buying. Cap. Right. Okay. Yeah. What, what happens when one of your micro caps fall 30, 40% or 50% or, or below that. So 
what is the thing that comes to your mind or what is the process then uh, what is the process then what uh, you will adopt then whether you will sell that micro cap or you will just wait or you will just invest more to average down the price what kind of thought process you apply in such situations you know i think the hardest part of investing is and this is not new or novel but you know the hardest part is disconnecting from the stock price and just keeping a pulse on the business and it's a hard thing to do when you're staring at a stock price go down 30, 40, 50%. And we've had here in the U S it's been really dramatic in the last 12 months. I mean, when Facebook's down 70% year to date, you know, you can only imagine what small and micro cap companies are doing as well. Um, so it's, it's difficult to do that, but you know, you really just need to keep a pulse in the business and make your decisions based on what the business is doing. You know, if the business is performing, to what you believe it should be performing. The stock's down 40%, you should be buying. Hmm. If the business is not performing, regardless of whether it's up 20% or down 20%, you should be selling, hmm. you know? And so you really just need to keep track and keep a pulse on this, on the business itself. And that's that's been key to my investment strategy, uh, you know, since really probably for the last 15 years when I really kind of got good at this is just, the maintenance due diligence of owning a position and making sure that you know what you own at all times on the business side. And that comes okay. from, and that comes from really just, you know, talking to management, but also talking to people in the industry, in the space, you know, because I, honestly, I've been doing this so long not because of some huge wins I've had and I've had a few, but it's mainly because I haven't taken the big losses, you know, along the way, being able to see when the business is shifting and selling before others you know, before it's known to other people. And so it's it's really important to always keep a pulse in the business. Um, and if the business is performing, you own it or buy more. And if not, you sell it. Right. I think this principle is equally applicable for mid-cap, small-cap, and large-caps. Yeah, I think so too. I would right. agree. So my next question is, Stanley Drucker, uh, Drucker Miller said, in his almanac that position sizing is 80% of the equation. So first of all, can you please just explain our retail investors what what uh, what is the meaning of position sizing? Well, the, the meaning of position sizing is like how big of a position size do you make it as a percentage of your portfolio? You know, and, and you'll get different answers from different folks. Um, you know, I'm a concentrated stock picker. So I'm in 10 companies. You know, and some people would think that's insanely concentrated. And then some people would sit, then other people, they're stock pickers and they might have 30 positions in their portfolio. And whether it's me at 10 or them at 30, when they buy into a position, you know, they might make it a 2% position or a 5% position or a 10% position, you know, and that's what we mean by position sizing. And so there's a couple of ways to look at it is, you know, what is your at cost position size? I mean, if you had, you know, $100,000 and you put $5,000 into something, you know, that's obviously a 5% at cost position. The other side of position sizing is how, what do you do after that? Like how big do you let that position get if it goes up? You know, what happens if it goes down? Do you add to it? What are your rules that you have in place? Do you have any rules? And so that's kind of in general, kind of what position sizing, what position mm -hmm. sizing means. Um, you know, and, and I would say, my thoughts on position sizing as a whole has evolved quite a bit on this topic. You know, I'm a, I'm a big fan of letting the market determine my position sizing. And what, what I mean by that is um, you don't have to bet big on micro caps, meaning, you know, I'm going to put 20% of my capital down at cost into this position. I mean, these are small businesses. And if you find the right business and management team that grow earnings per share over a 10 year period, you know, the stock quite honestly has a long way to run. Like you don't have to bet big right at the onset. Um, so I'm not necessarily a big fan of betting big, but I'm a big fan of letting a position get big. If that company executes, the management executes, the stock goes up and it becomes a bigger portion of your portfolio naturally because the stock goes up. And so ironically enough, I think the market actually does a really good job of determining your position sizing better than you do. You know, because over time, your winners become larger pieces of that portfolio and your losers become smaller. And I think a lot of times yeah, you get into trouble because you're you're trying to stop the market from doing what it's trying to do. And that is basically concentrate you into your winners. Right. So how do you uh, take positions? Do you take position in one go or do you take it in staggered form? 
Um, it normally it looks like, you know, when I'm doing due diligence into an idea and it checks all the big boxes and I've talked to, to the management team, maybe even traveled to meet with them, you know, I'll buy a position. Um, it really depends on valuation too. You know, if it checks all the boxes and it's cheap, you know, you might buy sooner or quicker. Um, but I'm a big fan of buying a little bit and then averaging in over time, you know, as the company executes, as you see management execute, um, as you build trust, you know, with them and their vision. Um, so I'm a big fan of adding after the initial purchase and what dictates that additional capital is really the business and the management team doing what they say and saying what they do. Um, and so that's, that's normally what it looks like. I and mean, quite honestly, I mean, the best positions are the ones that you're constantly averaging up in, you know, because they're executing and you can't be afraid to average up into a good situation. Um, where you get into trouble is, is when you average down uh, a lot of times, you know, when you kind of aren't able to disconnect the business from the stock, you know, and you're just averaging down because it's down, you know, that that's not a good reason to average down, you know. Um, so that that's kind of how I think about it. Okay. You have often spoken about putting yourself in uncomfortable situation in order to grow. So give us some example uh, where you were in uncomfortable situation and how, how it helped you to grow. You know, I, it's a good question. And I'm obviously not talking about investing because I don't think you should be in uncomfortable situations with your money. Uh, but I, th I do think it's important in life. And I'm, and I'm sure you've, you've gone through this as well. You know, I think when you're, when you're starting off your career, you, you need to put yourself in situations where other people can see your potential. And so kind of that advice is mainly towards, you know, younger people or any, people of any age that are just trying to, you know, just get better and get and better and, and excel. Um, you know, and so I could, that could mean something silly or not silly, but it could just mean raising your, your hand in class if you're a student, you know, and, and answering a question or two, even though it's scary, you know, that could mean, uh, leading a group presentation that could mean, you know, teaching a class, you know, that could mean leading your peers where you normally wouldn't, you know, whatever it is. But I think, I think the way you supercharge serendipity and luck in your life is putting yourself in more situations where people can see your potential. And a lot of that is just putting yourself in, in uncomfortable situations you know, that you generally don't want to do, you know? Okay. So would you like to share the last time you got into some uncomfortable situation and learned something or uh, learned something new, added something new? Well, right now, I'll be, be on this podcast <laughs> with you. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I would say, I would say the the last time was when uh, it's probably six months ago where, um, you know, now that I'm 40 years old, it, it's, it's, you kind of done a lot of things that you wanted to do. And now it's about kind of building a legacy or putting, putting, you know, building teams and really kind of going after it or, or teaching or things like that. And so I was asked to teach a class at a university six months ago. And, um, and I was, you know, it was kind of scary, you know, even though, I feel like I know what I'm talking about, you know, but still teaching, you know, a group of 18 or 20 year olds, you know, something that still can be intimidating. Uh, but it was a fun, it was a fun process uh, because, you know, there's no better way of learning than going out and teaching something, you know, solidifying things that you think, you know, but actually writing them down and teaching it, you know? And so I would say that was probably the last time where I kind of got outside of my, my comfort zone a little bit. And then on the business side, there's always things like I'm always cognizant of that, like uh, on the business side, you know, to always be kind of pushing, um, stretching yourself so you grow. Right. So according to you, what is the number one reason that retail investors are not able to earn good returns in stock market or they lose a lot of money in stock markets? You know, it's a, that's a good question. Um, I think there've been, there's probably been countless studies done, you know, even when investor, you know, even an investor like Peter Lynch, you know, in his fund, which I, I, I think, I think he produced like 28% returns over a very long period of time, then, you know, obviously outperformed the overall market by a wide margin. Uh, but there's a couple studies done that like 98% of the investors that invested with him didn't, didn't outperform the market, you know? And so you're like, well, why did how does that work? Like, why didn't they outperform when he outperformed? Well, it's because, you know, they could buy in and out of his fund and they were buying at the highs and selling at the lows, you know, predominantly a lot of his investors that are in his fund. 
So even though he catered at that point, a lot of the investors just didn't have the discipline or fortitude to do the right thing at the right time. And I think that's the hardest part about successful investing is it's really about doing the opposite of what your human nature tells you to do. I mean, our human nature tells us when you see a stock going up and up and over weeks or months or even years, you know, you, you rationalize or justify paying higher for it. You know, and then when a stock goes lower and lower and lower, you rationalize not doing anything. You know, um, you tend to overanalyze when stocks go down and underanalyze when stocks go up. You know, and so, um, again, it gets back to disconnecting the business from a stock. You know, it's just so hard to do. It's easy for me to tell you to do that. It's easier for you to tell other people to do that. But it's really hard to put that into practice. And I think that's that's really the toughest part. It's disconnecting that and disconnecting your emotions emotions from it. Great. So emotion plays a very important role. Uh, does it play an important role in winning also? Oh, it does. Yes. Yeah. G- greed, is, greed is a tough one as well. You know, I, I think... Um, there's four main reasons why I would sell a stock. You know, number one is you find something better than your worst idea in the portfolio. Um, number two is the business starts tracking away from your investment thesis. Number three, the management team shows signs of lacking integrity. Like I've had several instances where something just didn't all of a sudden something showed up in a filing and might have been a related party transaction where or something screwy it just didn't make sense and i just sell you know like i i don't have time for people that I, I can't trust you know number four is you sell because something goes up too high too fast you know even though i'm a long-term investor you know when something goes from a 10 pe to 150 pe it might be time to take something off um and those that falls under good problems to have you know when you have a position that goes up too far too fast (laughs) um and and that and that's 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 tough too because you're you're kind of bit by the green bug watching your net worth go higher and higher you start spending the money you haven't realized yet you know in a new house or new car or whatever um but yeah it's uh it's all about controlling your emotions whether it's a stock that's dropping or a stock that's going up and staying grounded in reality and anchoring to the business Right. You also run a uh, community called Micro Cap Club. My first question on this is from where this idea came to you that I should start a community of uh, uh, people who want to invest, who want to learn about Micro Cap Club. So Micro Cap Club originated. So my, my history was I became a full time private investor, just managing my own capital off my own balance sheet in 2008. So right at the depths of the crisis, you know, during that that time period. Um, and I just became a full-time private investor and I had my own blog at the time where I just talked about the few companies that I liked that I thought interesting. And, uh, back then, you know, blogging wasn't a huge deal. And so I just, I was able to get a big, big, bigger and bigger following. And it got to a point where every time I would post on something, it would move the markets and those equities up or down. And it just got, I didn't like that. You know, it was great for the ego, but it's, I just didn't like influencing markets like that. So I ended up shutting down my blog for two years. But I enjoyed talking about the stocks that I liked. I enjoyed hearing what other smart people were invested in, in this niche of investing. And so I kind of just came up with the idea of microcapclub.com, which is a private forum for experienced microcap investors, you know, from around the world globally, you know, really. And it just started and it's private. It's not accessible by the public. Uh, and I was just interested to see what, what other smart people in my niche of investing liked and why. And when it started, it was basically just me talking to myself, I'm going to be honest, because <laughs> it's, it's hard to build a small, active, private community. You know, it's just hard to do, you know. Um, so the first two or three years was, it was me kind of pushing much of the conversation. But over time, we attracted some, some, some really good investors into it. And 10 years later, you know, we probably have close to 800 kind of investors from around the world kind of talking about the micro caps that that they like and why and so the the internals or the 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 inside of micro cap club is basically a message board where each thread is a, a member might post an idea that they like a two or three page investment thesis and that starts the thread and then comments happen after that and so we have since 2011 when micro cap club was launched i think we have about 860 
companies now that have been kind of profiled and those conversations started, you know, and, and it's been, it's been a really, really cool experience. So it's been a great asset to me as an investor because I get to see what the top investors are looking at. You know, it's a great way to get idea flow. And now that I do manage some outside capital um, in a fund that I manage, you know, it's been a great place to spot up and coming talent, you know, mm-hmm. so, you know, you know, so the younger, there's a predominantly a lot of younger investors in microcap. So you get to see these folks when they're teenagers and you get to watch them and how they talk, talk or articulate about investing. And so it's been a great place to kind of spot talent as well. Um, and so it's, it's been a great resource. I mean, it's a very active, small community. There's only 300 members and, the other thing I wanted to do is I didn't want to have, I didn't want to make it where you have to pay to be a member. You know, I wanted it to be, didn't matter if you were a 15 year old with $500 or $200 in your bank account. I want, if you're smart, I want you to be part of the community, you know? And so basically to become a member, you just submit an application, which is a two or three page investment thesis on your favorite micro cap stock. And then every month our membership votes on the, the quality level of that investment thesis. And if you get enough, enough votes, you get in. And if you don't, you don't. And so every, any given month, we usually have about 20 applicants every month and we vote on those and usually two or three get in every month. Um, and so it's been, um, so we have about 350 core members. And then later on, after six years of doing this, when I launched it in 2011, you know, I, I was, it was, it was costing me quite a bit of money to keep this website running because I'm a type of person, like I wanted to look professional, you know, so I had like a full-time kind of person there in charge of the website, in charge of doing video editing and all that stuff, uh, your website, make it look like you're bigger than what you are. That's the key, you know? Uh, mm-hmm. And so finally I was like, okay, let's, let's, uh, how do we monetize this in a way that doesn't destroy the ethos of what this community is about? And so we do have a subscription mechanism there now where, Hey, if you don't have the time or ability to become a member, you know, which is free to be a member, you can pay an amount of money and you can get view only access of those conversations we're having kind of internally uh, on the club. And so, so right. So like I say, today we're like a community of 800, 900, and we have an event we put on every year called the Microcap Leadership Summit. You know, pre-COVID it was physical, you know, in Chicago, uh, it's been virtual the last two or three years, but we hope to get back to physical and, um, Again, it's a, it's a small event, probably 150 people, but probably half of those people fly in from overseas, you know, which is kind of cool. You know, it's a small but global community. Yeah. Right. So uh, just the last question. Give me or tell me three major characteristics a good investor should have. Yeah, it's a, that's a good question. It's it's something I've been thinking about recently. Um it's like, how, how do you go from good to great or even go from average to good, you know, in the investment, in the investment world? Um, I think in any industry or art or even a sport, I think there's a certain set of skills that one needs to have to be able to participate in that industry, art or sport. You know, I think if you talk to an amateur cricket player or a professional cricket player, they would probably outline three or four or five skills you would need to be able to participate in that sport, let alone do it well. Um, and I think that you would, a musician, the same thing, or, or whatever industry that you're involved in professionally. I think there's always, oftentimes a set of skills. And I think... I think investing is no different. And I think to be really good at investing, you need to be good at all of those skills. I think to be great, meaning like the top 0.1% of investors, you know, I think you need to be good at all those skills, but you need to be the best in the world at one, but maybe two of those skills. And so what are those skills for investing? Um, broadly speaking, I would say there's four main skills in investing. It's identifying opportunities, Hmm. it's buying, it's holding, and it's selling. Hmm. And we can get, you can get in granularity under each one of those, but you know, kind of when you think about identifying something, especially in micro cap, 
you know, it's, it's really important to identify situations and find it before others. So this one might be a skill that is more important than in, if you were a large cap investor or, or something where it's already been a discovery already made into that business. So I think those are the main skills that would probably be universally agreed upon, whether you're a value investor, a venture capitalist, a private equity investor is kind of identifying, buying, holding, and selling. And I think to be good, you have to be good at all of those. If you want to be great, depending on your school of investing, you need to be top 0.1% in one of those four to really be great at what you do. And there's a bunch of other kind of prior behaviors or attributes that I think are important that would allow you to become a good, if not great. And it depends on your school of investing you practice, whether that's value or merging or micro cap or whatever it is. But I think number one is kind of just having an independent mindset. And that's especially important in micro cap because of the conversation we had earlier about there's no analyst coverage here. And so it really forces you to have an independent mindset because nobody else is doing the work for you. That means you have to do the work right. and you have to live with the live with the consequences of your decisions. There's no one else to blame in the bad times, no one else to give you praise in the good times. It's all on you. And I think that's, that's important to have. And I think it's, I think just having that discipline and focus kind of falls under that category as well. You know, I think for most people, they spend way too much time watching other people play their game instead of focusing on their own game. You know, just think about yourself, like whether it's paying attention too much to the news, to macro strategist, to predictions, seeing how much your buddy is up in his portfolio versus you, you know, letting jealousy or whatever take hold. It's like there's probably 90% of your time is wasted just watching other people play their game instead of focusing on your own game and becoming the best at what you can be. And I think that is really, really important to becoming good at all those skills, but ultimately being the best at one of them. Um, I think decisiveness in identifying opportunities is really, really important. Uh, we kind of hit on that with the identifying it, but you know, you really need to know what you're looking for. That's mm -hmm. what decisiveness is. So you really need to know what you're looking for to be able to find it quickly. And also the ability to have kind of extreme abstinence towards ideas that don't fit what you're looking for. The ability to say no, because you're going to look at a hundred ideas and you're going to say no to 99 of them. So you need to be quick at say no. And again, it gets back to just being good at knowing what you're looking for. Um, I think other things that fall into these categories is you need to get good at assessing the quality of a business, valuing a business, and forming realistic expectations about the future of that business. Right. You know, I think I this think is coming under attribute. identifying a good business. Exactly. Yes. Um, well, it, that one would, could be could be could also be under buying as well. But I'm just kind of going through things that kind of attributes that get you to getting to be good at, at all of these. And obviously, if you're a private equity investor or if you're a venture capital investor, the art of selling, you don't really have to pay too much attention to because that's going to be taken care of for you, whether that company right. gets acquired or somebody else buys into it or buys out your position. But, you know, but, but also kind of assessing the quality of management. I think that is a, a it's something you need to work on that you may or may not, depending on how you invest, you may or not think that is important. But for me, that's important. So just working on building that, building that up and assessing the quality level of people that of management. Um, I think the ability to form extreme conviction is really, really important. Um, but it has to be conviction rooted in the business. You know, unlike, unlike a, a good marriage, you know, I think it's I think it's important to be able to fall in love with your stocks, but be also be able to divorce them quickly. You know, once once that business or that thesis starts to crack, so it's kind of a, a duality there of like you want to be able to form extreme conviction if the business says that you should have extreme conviction, but if that thing starts cracking, you better be able to sell it the next day and not lose any sleep over it. Um, so I think that is also kind of an attribute that's important to have. Um, probably last, and again, I'm still kind of fill, 
I started thinking about this. You asked this question. I started thinking about this like a week ago, so I don't have my thoughts fully drilled down. But you know, probably the last one would be just the consistency of being really good at something. I, I think the greatest discipline is just the consistency of training every day. And the consistency in this case is consistency of maintenance due diligence and just mm -hmm. being on top of it every day. A lot of my biggest mistakes were when I just took my eye off the ball, mm -hmm. you know, and so you wake up every day doing the same thing and it looks boring, you know, but that's what builds you into the person you're going to become. It's what's going to build this portfolio into hopefully something much bigger. Right. Since, since we were talking about skills and skills is something which can be developed. So any initial ideas how a person can develop these skills of identifying good company? The first steps, what should be the first steps one person should take to identify a good company? Well, I, I think we hit on a little bit of it before. You know, I, and I think with these skills, you know, the, you can't learn them by reading a book or sitting in a classroom. You have to do it through experience and putting in the reps. Right. Um, and, and, and so I think that's first and foremost. And so you just have to be able to kind of withstand some pain, you know, as you go through that learning experience of, of doing this. And so I'm a big fan of doing, mm -hmm. you know, I'm not a big fan of paper trading or paper investing, you know, just because 99% of investing is putting your money on the line and dealing with the consequences, dealing with the emotional component of, you know, putting your money on the line. And so I'm a big fan of learning these skills by doing, um, also educating yourself, obviously at the same time. Uh, but I think w when it comes to identifying, you have to, I, you also have to know what type of investor you are, mm -hmm. you know, cause that, that will determine like how you find your opportunities. Like I said before, like with, if you're, if you're a deep value investor, you just do a screen mm -hmm. for everything, trading under book value and have at it, you know, and that's how it starts the process. You know, if you're, if you're an investor like me, it's a little bit more complex than that. Um, so, and especially in microcap too, where what I'm also trying to find are, are, are companies that are on an inflection point, you know, maybe going from good to great, you know, and so, you know, trust, you're looking for different things. So it depends on your, the school of investing that you practice. And I think we all evolve over time. I mean, the way I, the way I invest today is different, not extremely different, but it's different than how I invested five years ago. And it's probably even a lot different than where I, how I invested 10 years ago, you know, so, it, so it's important to understand that you're going to evolve over time you know, your whole life and your, the way you invest is, is kind of like a painting, you know, you're painting it over time and it might not make sense or look good to other people, but you know, you just keep on putting those brush strokes down and, and it's a, uh, it's, it's a game of evolving, you know, and I imagine another five years, the way I invest will be a little bit different than the way I'm speaking to you today. You know, I probably would have evolved somewhere, nothing extreme, but oftentimes your alpha is generated by little tweaks you make on the fringes you know how you look at things right thank you very much and i have some different questions other than investing so have you ever visited india sure. i have not i have not i have been i will likely i will because i've been asked to, i've been asked to come from a few people too so i, I would really enjoy enjoy coming over there but i've never been there and have you ever seen a bollywood movie i have not yeah, would, no. you, you should, would you have uh, any recommendations? <laughs> uh, you should you should see one uh, web series that is Scam 1992. Okay. It's it's about stock market only. So you should at least see it once. It, it happened in okay, India. I'm going to write is, that uh, down. Yeah. Okay. It's scam Scam 1992. 1992. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. And I really enjoyed a lot and learned a lot. I hope I will be finding some good micro caps very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. तो अब समय आ गया है इस एपिसोड की पूरी की पूरी समरी आप लोगों को देने के लिए उम्मीद करता हूं कि आप लोग इस समरी से बहुत ज्यादा फायदा उठाएंगे आज हमने शुरुआत करी यह जानने से कि माइक्रो कैप कंपनी कौन सी होती हैं और माइक्रो कैप कंपनी के अंदर इन्वेस्टिंग के लिए हमें किन किन बातों का ध्यान रखना चाहिए आज हमने यह सीखा कि यह जो कंपनीज होती है इन पे बहुत कम इंफॉर्मेशन जो है वो मार्केट में अवेलेबल होती है बहुत कम एनालिस्ट हैं जो इनको ट्रैक करते हैं और इसलिए इनके बारे में इंफॉर्मेशन पाना थोड़ा सा डिफिकल्ट होता है 
जब भी आप किसी कंपनी में इन्वेस्ट करते हैं तो डेफिनेटली बहुत जरूरी होता है जानना कि उस कंपनी की मैनेजमेंट कैसी है लेकिन माइक्रो कैप्स के केस में ये बहुत ज्यादा जरूरी हो जाता है कि आप ये जानें कि इस कंपनी की जो मैनेजमेंट है वो कैसी है उस कंपनी की अगर मैनेजमेंट अच्छी नहीं होगी तो माइक्रो कैप कभी भी बहुत ज्यादा स्केल नहीं कर पाएगी और आप लोग बहुत ज्यादा वेल्थ क्रिएट नहीं कर पाएंगे एक बात तो पक्की है कि माइक्रो कैप इन्वेस्टिंग के अंदर रिस्क थोड़ा ज्यादा इन्वॉल्व होता है और ये कमजोर दिल वालों के लिए नहीं है हो सकता है आप लोगों के बहुत कम बैट्स जो है बहुत कम आप लोगों की जो सिलेक्शन वो सक्सेसफुल हो लेकिन जब वो सक्सेसफुल होगी तो आपको बहुत जबरदस्त रिटर्न देके जाएगी तो बोलते हैं कि यहां पे रिस्क रिवॉर्ड रेशियो बहुत हाई है रिस्क भी ज्यादा है और जब रिवॉर्ड मिलते हैं तो वो भी बहुत ज्यादा मिलते हैं माइक्रो कैप इन्वेस्टिंग में अगर आपको ऐसी कंपनी मिल जाए जिसका ऐसा बिजनेस है जिसकी बहुत ज्यादा डिमांड है वो बिजनेस जो है वो स्केयर सिटी के अंदर है तो डेफिनेटली आप लोगों को एक बहुत अच्छा बिजनेस हाथ में लग सकता है और जिसमें आप लोग इन्वेस्ट करके अपने पैसों को ग्रो कर सकते हैं इन्वेस्टिंग में पोजिशन साइजिंग पे हम लोगों ने बात करी पोजिशन साइजिंग क्या होता है कि बेसिकली आपने जो है कंपनी का कितना बड़ा हिस्सा जो है वो लिया है या आपने अपने पोर्टफोलियो का कितना बड़ा हिस्सा जो है कंपनी के अंदर इन्वेस्ट किया है इस पर यह इनका यह कहना था कि वो मार्केट को डिटरमाइन करने देते हैं कि पोजिशन साइजिंग क्या होगी उनके पोर्टफोलियो में एक पर्टिकुलर कंपनी की जैसे जैसे कंपनी ग्रो करती जाती है वैसे वैसे उस कंपनी का इनके पोर्टफोलियो में हिस्सा भी बढ़ता जाता है कब एक माइक्रो कैप को बेच देना चाहिए इस बात पे ईएन ने जो है हमें बताए हैं तीन अल्टरनेटिव बेसिकली इन तीन सर्कमस्टांसिस में आप अपने माइक्रो कैप को बेच सकते हैं नंबर वन जब वो बिजनेस जो है अपने विजन से भटक जाए यानी कि जो उसकी इनिशियल थॉट था जो उनका इनिशियल बिजनेस का थॉट प्रोसेस था वो चेंज हो जाए और वो जो नया बिजनेस मॉडल है वो आपको समझ ना आए नंबर टू जब मैनेजमेंट की इंटीग्रिटी पे सवाल उठ जाए और आपको लगे कि नहीं यार अभी मैनेजमेंट सही काम नहीं कर रही हो नंबर थ्री जब आपके पास इससे बेटर अपॉर्चुनिटी जो है वो अवेलेबल हो और सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट लर्निंग जो बिल्कुल सेशन के लास्ट में मिली कि एक ग्रेट इन्वेस्टर्स के पास जो है वो क्या क्या चीजें होनी चाहिए तो ग्रेट इन्वेस्टर कौन होते हैं जिनको ये चार बातें बहुत अच्छी तरह से आती हैं नंबर वन कि वो अच्छे बिजनेस को बड़े आसानी से या बहुत अच्छे से आइडेंटिफाई करना जानते हैं अच्छी अपॉर्चुनिटीज को अच्छे से आइडेंटिफाई करना चाहते हैं जानते हैं और नंबर टू फिर वो उन अपॉर्चुनिटीज पर विश्वास रख के उन्हें बाय करते हैं नंबर थ्री वो उनको होल्ड करके रखते हैं लंबे समय के लिए या उस समय तक जब तक वो सही चल रही होती है नंबर फोर उनको बेचते हैं और वेल्थ क्रिएट करते हैं और फिर आगे चलते हैं और ऐसी कंपनीज को आइडेंटिफाई करने के लिए और ये सारी चीजों के अंदर दो बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट चीजें आप लोगों को चाहिए यानी कि आइडेंटिफाइंग बाइंग होल्डिंग एंड सेलिंग के अंदर दो बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट चीजें जो आप लोगों को चाहिए वो भी हमें ईएन ने बताई और वो है आपके बिहेवियरल एट्रीब्यूट और दो बिहेवियर एट्रीब्यूट कौन से नंबर वन आप लोगों को बड़ा जबरदस्त फोकस माइंड चाहिए नंबर टू आपको इंडिपेंडेंट माइंड चाहिए फोकस माइंड से मतलब है कि आप लोगों को अपनी गेम पे ध्यान रखना है और इंडिपेंडेंट माइंड मतलब आपको इमोशन से फ्री रहना है आप लोगों को अपना थॉट प्रोसेस जो है वो बहुत क्लियर रखना है और इसी के साथ जो बेसिक प्रिंसिपल है वो बिल्कुल नहीं भूलना है कि आप लोगों को इन्वेस्टिंग तभी करनी है जब आपकी जबरदस्त कन्विक्शन है आपका जबरदस्त विश्वास है उस कंपनी के अंडरलाइंग बिजनेस के अंदर तो ये था आज का मार्केट की बात का एपिसोड आई होप आप लोगों ने इंजॉय किया इंजॉय किया तो एक बार फिर से रिक्वेस्ट करूंगा कि उसको सबके साथ शेयर कर दीजिएगा और साथ साथ में चैनल को जो है वो सब्सक्राइब कर लीजिएगा आई बटन में आप लोगों को बहुत सारे और मार्केट की बात के एपिसोड मिल जाएंगे और हम लोग आपको स्पॉटीफाई पर मिल जाते हैं ताकि आप लोग जब वॉक कर रहे हो जब आप लोग जिम कर रहे हो या जब आप लोग और किसी काम में व्यस्त हो लेकिन साथ में आप लोग कुछ सुनना चाहते हैं तो मार्केट की बात को आप लोग स्पॉटीफाई पर भी सुन सकते हैं राइट गाइज विद दिस नॉट थैंक यू वेरी मच स्टे कनेक्टेड स्टे हेट जय हिंद और हम इतना सीखते रहे क्योंकि सीखना शुरू तो जीतना शुरू बाय बाय एंड टेक केयर गॉड ब्लेस यू ऑल Investment in securities market are subject to market risks. Read all the related documents carefully before investing. Please read the risk disclosure documents carefully before investing in equity shares, derivatives, mutual fund, and/or other instruments traded on the stock exchanges.